this presentation will briefly do a shallow dive into the management of status epilepticus. Treatment for status epilepticus is largely medication-based, so we will focus on proper drug selection in a step-by-step -step approach. 1% of emergency department visits are due to seizures. Up to 5% of the world population will have a seizure at some point in their life. Although the rate is slightly lower in developed regions like Hong Kong, children are more resilient than adults with a dramatically lower mortality rate. Seizures occur more often at the extremes of age, so young infants and those over the age of 60, and they occur at the same rate in males and females. Definitions of status epilepticus have been varying and changing recently, but essentially, for treatment in the A&E, we will view them as seizure activity for longer than five minutes. The average seizure lasts less than two minutes. If seizures have been going on for over 30 minutes, that is when permanent brain damage may start to occur, so you can see the urgency of this disease state. The early signs of a seizure are very different from the later signs where clinical seizures may not be apparent, but pulmonary edema, cardiac failure, and rhabdomyolysis may be present. Upon noticing these early signs of a seizure listed here, there are many things you can do for a patient who is not in the hospital if you see a seizure in the community. All healthcare professionals should know what to do in case of a seizure regardless of the setting. These would be counseling points for the pharmacist to discuss with a patient's friend or family upon discharge from the A&E. First off, don't put anything in their mouth. In addition to it being weird, it could easily choke or bite your fingers. Also, don't hold the patient down. That can just cause more injury and is not beneficial. Try to cushion the patient's head if possible, loosen tight clothing, turn the patient on their side, keep track of the duration of the seizure, and search for a medical alert ID. Because if this is their first seizure, then they definitely need to go to the A&E. Whereas if they have known epilepsy, they don't necessarily always need to go to the A&E. This probably goes without saying, but move them to a safe area if they started seizing in a dangerous area, like while crossing the street or in a knife shop. Lastly, don't leave anyone alone after a seizure until they are able to answer the four W's, who, what, when, and where, and also they should be breathing normally. In patients with a history of seizures, the most common cause of status epilepticus is non-adherence to medications. New onset causes of status epilepticus are mostly idiopathic. 9% result from a stroke and another 9% from head trauma. When assessing a patient with status epilepticus, the following labs and screening should be completed and evaluated by the pharmacist. Other orders listed on the right column may also be ordered and assessed based on the patient's history and presentation. With the comprehensive metabolic panel, you are looking to see if severe electrolyte imbalances, hypoglycemia, and hyperglycemia are any of the reversible causes of seizures and status epilepticus. With the complete blood count, you are assessing the white blood cell count for an infectious cause of the seizure and the platelet count for a hemorrhagic cause of the seizure, possibly an intracranial hemorrhage. Arrhythmias or cardiac ischemia may result from prolonged status epilepticus. This graphic shows the general treatment time frame of status epilepticus. The first five minutes are the stabilization phase. This is where patient's airways are secured, 
and they are provided oxygen or mechanical ventilation if required. Where mechanical ventilation may require pharmacotherapy, the sedatives of choice would be midazolam or propofol as they have anticonvulsant properties as opposed to the normal drug of choice for rapid sequence intubation, etomidate, which does not have any anticonvulsant properties. Neuromuscular blocking agents are the other drugs given during an intubation. However, if they are given, you can no longer physically assess to see if the seizures have resolved or not. So they should not be given to facilitate the intubation unless an EEG is ordered, which is not common practice in Hong Kong A&E departments. Usually, the patient would need to be sent to the ICU to get EEG monitoring. Succinylcholine lasts much shorter, so if you are going to use an agent, succinylcholine is definitely the preferred neuromuscular blocking agent. Thiamine 100 mg is recommended in conjunction with dextrose boluses in patients who appear malnourished or alcoholic for prevention of Wernicke's encephalopathy. Hypoglycemia is an uncommon cause of status epilepticus but is low risk therapy so all patients will receive if blood glucose is low or unknown. For children between 12 to 18 months of age, a trial of pyridoxine or vitamin B6 should be initiated until metabolic causes have been ruled out. Rectal paracetamol for hyperthermia and also vasopressors may be needed if systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeters of mercury. The second phase of treatment is to administer a dose of a benzodiazepine if not already administered in the ambulance or en route to the hospital. IV lorazepam or IM midazolam are the preferred benzodiazepines and they can be redosed after five minutes if they were ineffective. The secondary phase is where more long-term therapy may be initiated. Phenytoin has been the most common in the past, but valproate and levetiracetam are becoming more popular. Lastly, about 15% of status epilepticus patients will reach a refractory phase where we start continuous infusions of barbiturates, midazolam, or propofol. During these initial few phases, you should also be treating the underlying cause of the seizures, such as if there's an infection, you should be giving antimicrobials, if the patient has an abscess or increased intracranial pressure, surgery may be required, um, if there's an overdose, giving the appropriate antidotes, and so forth. The benzodiazepines, after one to two doses, are effective in stopping 50 to 80 percent of cases of status epilepticus. Diazepam is the fastest as it is the most lipophilic and penetrates the blood-brain barrier with relative ease. However, it is very short-acting as the drug rapidly gets redistributed into the adipose tissue. Lorazepam would be the next fastest, but it can only be given once IV access has been established. Phenytoin has a significantly slower onset, so generally isn't used until after the benzodiazepines. Midazolam is nice because it can be given IM or bucally. After the benzodiazepines have failed, these are the three second-line agents. Traditionally, phenytoin has been used in the past, but more recent data has supported that valproate is better tolerated in patients than phenytoin. Levetiracetam may also be used, particularly in patients with many comorbidities or on many medications at higher risk of drug-drug interactions. Levetiracetam has the fewest drug-drug interactions and is renally eliminated rather than hepatically metabolized. 
Lastly, if all else failed, you would be using high doses of one of the three following medications. High dose would be doses similar to what is used for sedation in surgery. Midazolam is an acceptable agent, but doses generally need to be increased after one to two days because tachyphylaxis of the medication often develops. Propofol and barbiturates have some data showing that they also may be more efficacious than midazolam, but each come with their own concerns that are addressed elsewhere. If you are using doses of the sedation this high, generally all these patients will need to be mechanically intubated. So once you've reached this stage, it is also time to send them to the ICU for more comprehensive and intensive management. That concludes this section. Thank you for your time and attention.